It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this talk is Determinants of Global Health. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include discuss the important role of understanding the determinants of global health, review the five categories of health determinants, discuss the health risks of indoor air pollution and contaminated water, review the four categories of genetic diseases, discuss major gender and age determinants of global health, discuss the close linkages between social environmental determinants and healthy behaviors, review the importance of deep beliefs and values informing cultural institutions and behaviors, discuss the five support functions communities provide for members, discuss how healthcare access is linked to the economy and healthcare payment systems of a country, and discuss the importance of integration to improve global health. I'd like to start this session with a quote from the text Essentials of Global Health, authored by Richard Skolnick. If we want to understand the most important global health issues and what can be done to address them, then we must understand what factors have the most influence on health status, how health status is measured, and what key trends in health status have occurred historically. This session will focus on the determinants of global health or key factors that influence the health of individuals around our globe. Many feel that the discrepancy of health status worldwide is primarily related to healthcare access issues. Though healthcare access is one determinant of health, Research and experience clearly demonstrates that there are many other factors or determinants that significantly impact the health of people worldwide. The physical environment, health behaviors, primary prevention practices, individual characteristics, and the social environment. These are not exhaustive lists, but represent examples of each determinant category. The physical environment is an important health determinant. For example, both indoor and outdoor environmental air pollutants are important determinants of health globally. Most people are aware of the risks of outdoor air pollution, particularly in the world's large cities, as we see in this picture of smog in Nairobi, Kenya. In the developing world, indoor air pollution is often a major risk for respiratory diseases and asthma associated with indoor cooking, lighting, or heating absent adequate ventilation. The World Health Organization estimates that around 3 billion of the world's poorest people still rely on solid fuels, wood, animal dung, charcoal, crop wastes, and coal, burned in inefficient stoves for cooking and heating and some 1.2 billion light their homes with simple kerosene lamps. These household energy practices emit large quantities of health damaging particulate matter and climate warming pollutants, for example, black carbon, into the household environment, increasing the risk of respiratory illnesses, including childhood pneumonia and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cardiovascular diseases, and lung cancers. Global burden of disease estimates have found that exposure to household air pollution due to cooking on inefficient biomass stoves led to an estimated 4.3 million deaths in 2012. This does not include risks related to the use of inefficient lighting like candles or kerosene lamps. The data also does not consider deaths or diseases related to 
the use of coal, kerosene, or biomass heating systems, which may also emit large quantities of particulate-laden smoke, either directly into the household or outdoors in the neighborhood. This graph demonstrates that low middle income homes around the world, and particularly in Southeast Asia, the Western Pacific region in Africa, accounted for almost all deaths attributed to household air pollution, HAP, in 2012 versus those associated with high income HI countries. The World Health Organization estimates that globally at least 2 billion people use a drinking water source contaminated with feces. Contaminated water can transmit many diseases, including diarrhea, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, and polio, etc. Contaminated drinking water is estimated to cause 485,000 diarrheal deaths each year, particularly in children. By 2025, half of the world's population will be living in water-stressed areas. In least developed countries, 22% of healthcare facilities have no water service, 21% have no sanitation service, and 22% have no waste management service. Sanitation refers to the provision of facilities and services for the safe management of human excreta from the toilet to containment or disposal and the safe management of solid and animal waste. Poor sanitation is linked to transmission of diseases such as cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, hepatitis A, typhoid, polio, and many ignored tropical diseases like intestinal worms, dracunculiasis, schistosomiasis, trachoma, etc. Inadequate sanitation is estimated to cause 432,000 diarrheal deaths annually. Poor sanitation also contributes to malnutrition, stunting, impaired cognition, sense of well-being that impacts school attendance, anxiety, and safety with lifelong consequences, especially for women and girls. Two billion people still do not have basic sanitation facilities, such as toilets or latrines. Of these, 673 million still defecate in the open, for example, in street gutters, behind bushes, or into open bodies of water. At least 10% of the world's population consume food irrigated by untreated wastewater. Improving sanitation in households, health facilities, and schools underpins progress on a wide range of health and economic development issues, including health coverage and combating antimicrobial resistance. Individual characteristics impact health and include genetics, gender, age, etc. Let's spend a few minutes discussing some basics of genetic biology. Genetic disease or inherited diseases generally fall into four categories. One, single gene inheritance is also called Mendelian or monogenetic inheritance. Single gene disorders have different patterns of expression, including autosomal dominant inheritance, in which only one copy of a defective gene from either parent is necessary to cause the condition. Autosomal recessive inheritance, in which two copies of a defective gene, one from each parent, are necessary to cause the condition. And X-linked inheritance, in which the defective gene is present on the X chromosome. X-linked inheritance may be dominant or recessive. Changes or mutations that occur in the DNA sequence of a single gene cause this type of inherited disease. There are thousands of known single gene disorders, including cystic fibrosis, Marfan syndrome, sickle cell anemia, Huntington's disease, etc. Two, multifactorial inheritance disorders, 
are caused by a combination of environmental factors along with the mutation of genes. Examples of multifactorial inheritance diseases include heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, breast cancer, diabetes, obesity, etc. Three, chromosomal abnormalities. Chromosomes are distinct structures made up of DNA and protein located in the nucleus of each cell. Because chromosomes are the carriers of genetic material, abnormalities in chromosome numbers or structure can result in disease. Chromosome abnormalities typically occur due to problems encountered during the process of cell division. Examples of chromosome genetic diseases include Down syndrome with three copies of chromosome 21 and Turner syndrome where one X chromosome is missing. Four, mitochondrial inherited genetic disorders are caused by mutations in the non-nuclear DNA of mitochondria. Mitochondria are often described as a cell's energy generating center since female egg cells, but not male sperm cells, keep their mitochondria during fertilization, mitochondrial DNA genetic disorders are always inherited from the female parent. Examples of mitochondrial inheritance disorders include Leber's optic atrophy and myoclonic epilepsy. This slide provides just a few examples of common gender associated health conditions. Women have risks of breast, ovarian, and uterine cancer. Approximately four times more women suffer from osteoporosis than men. Roughly 70% of those living with autoimmune diseases are female. In Western cultures, almost 10 times more women than men suffer from eating disorders, such as anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Alzheimer's disease has a higher rate in women than men. Approximately two times more women than men suffer from unipolar clinical depression. Prostate cancer and testicular cancer only occurs in men. Stomach, esophageal, liver, and oral cancers which often are associated with lifestyle-based risk factors are more common in men. X-linked recessive inheritance diseases like color blindness occur more frequently in men. Hemophilia A and B occur almost exclusively in men. Abdominal aortic aneurysms are six times more common in men. Autism is approximately four times more prevalent in males than females. Schizophrenia is about 1.4 times more common in males and on average starts two years earlier and results in more severe symptoms in men. Men are two times more likely than women to be affected by antisocial personality disorders and substance use disorders. The data on this slide is from the World Health Organization and lists age-associated causes of death for lower middle income countries in 2016 to 2017. The leading causes of death among children under five were preterm birth complications, acute respiratory infections, intrapartum related complications, congenital anomalies, and diarrhea. For adults, the leading causes of death included ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, liver cirrhosis, and road injuries. Healthy behaviors or primary prevention factors include injury prevention practices, adequate exercise and diet, etc. Education and income are linked and are powerful determinants of health for several reasons. Education provides information and knowledge regarding good health practices. 
Education also provides skills that result in more employment opportunities and better paying jobs, resulting in a higher income for the individual and their family and a higher social status within the community. Compared to infants of normal weight, low birth weight infants are at increased health risks. Low birth weight babies are often more prone to infections during the first few days of life. They also have increased risks for longer term problems such as delayed motor and social development or learning disabilities. Maternal risk factors for lower birth weight babies include smoking, drinking alcohol, lack of weight gain during pregnancy, the mother younger than 15 years or older than 35, social and economic factors including low income, low educational level, stress, domestic violence or other abuse, and being unmarried. Other maternal risk factors for low birth weight babies include the history of a previous preterm birth and environmental factors like exposure to air pollution, both indoor and outdoor, and drinking water contaminated with lead. The best indicator of a baby's birth weight is the educational level attained by the mother. So enhancing the education level of women and girls is a significant targeted strategy to improve the health of children. This lists other healthy behaviors that are also linked to better educated individuals, including better diets, less smoking, less obesity, families with less children, improved child care, and improved child health. Improved child care is associated with improved child nutrition. There is a strong correlation between the nutritional status of infants and young children and the extent to which they meet their biological potentials, enroll in schools, or stay in school. On Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs diagram, education helps individuals and families move from the area of having to focus on meeting deficiency needs, the survival area, to the growth area of the pyramid, where individuals and families can focus on the future health benefits of primary prevention and healthy behaviors. Major deficiency needs must be significantly satisfied before growth, self-actualization, or self-transcendence can be successfully pursued. A major point is that improving educational opportunities across the globe for all individuals will significantly improve health and healthy behaviors. Let's now consider the concept of culture and how it influences healthy behaviors. This is a diagram of culture adapted from J. Linwood Barney. The behaviors human beings manifest are dependent on deeper layers of culture as diagrammed. The worldview or deep beliefs are located at the center of culture. Those deep beliefs generally fall into four broad categories. Beliefs about self as a human being, beliefs about nature, the supernatural, and time, the past, present, and future. Those deep beliefs or worldview set the base for a culture's values or the things a culture deems important. It's upon those deep beliefs and values that a culture builds its institutions. These institutions include the way a culture governs itself, educates children, marries people, judges right and wrong, organizes and runs its businesses, etc. Finally, those beliefs and values and institutions influence and dictate the behaviors individuals of a culture manifest. The main point is that cultural beliefs and values about health, 
illness, health care, health care policies, trust of government, etc., are extremely important social environment determinants of health related behaviors. Let's now turn our attention to the social environment. Though we've already briefly discussed how the income, education, and culture determinants of the social environment influence healthy behaviors, let's continue a brief discussion of gender norms and social support structures. Gender norms are closely linked to a culture's deep beliefs, values, and institutions. A major global health gender norm issue is the social status of women. In many societies, women are relegated to a lower social status than men, which translates into lower income, less education, and more dangerous work conditions, all of which are associated with poorer health. The presence of strong social networks for individuals and families are associated with increased health. Providing those strong social networks is a function of a cohesive, effective community structure. Let's spend a few minutes discussing community functions. So what is a community? Community engagement specialists often define community differently versus other organizations. Many organizations define community by geopolitical boundaries, living in a certain area of a large city, living in a certain township of a rural area, etc. Key attributes of a community to a community engagement specialist would include, one, people in a community know each other by first name, which usually limits a community size to about 1,000 to 1,500 people, and two, true community members have a sense of shared responsibility, fellowship, belonging, and obligation to other members of that group. The following situation illustrates a difference between a geopolitical and common community engagement definition of community. People may live in the same apartment building and know each other by first name, but not feel an obligation to help other individuals in that building when they experience a personal disaster like death, loss of their job, severe illness, etc. Using the geopolitical definition, individuals in that apartment building would be considered members of a community. To a community engagement specialist, they would not be a community if they failed to meet the two key attributes listed on this slide. Using these attributes versus just a geopolitical definition, communities may then include prostitutes working in a region of a state, street children living in a sewer system of a large city, ethnic groups scattered across a country, a small rural town, schools, businesses, faith-based groups, and various organizations like Kiwanis, Optimists, Knights of Columbus, sororities, fraternities, etc. Beyond the two key community attributes of knowing each other by first name and having a sense of shared responsibility for each other, true communities may also, but not always, live in the same geographic area as mentioned above have common norms, laws, rules, and statutes, use the same language, and hold similar cultural beliefs, values, institutions, and behaviors. True communities that meet the key attributes on this slide provide incredible socialization opportunities for their members. True communities perform five functions listed on this slide. One, true communities provide members with reasonable opportunities and support to meet community members' needs. This translates into the community helping its members meet their social determinants of health. Two, True communities provide members with socialization avenues or opportunities. 
The community utilizes these socialization avenues to instill within members the communities and cultures, beliefs, values, institutions, behaviors, and norms as diagrammed and previously discussed. This process of instilling beliefs, values, institutions, behaviors, and norms would also be considered the process of enculturation. Methods of socialization and enculturation may be steeped in community or cultural tradition, impacted by modeling of respected formal and informal leaders and reinforced through more formal teaching methods. Three, communities provide social controls. Communities develop ways to enforce adherence or conformance to community values and norms. This may take several forms from informal community pressure to more formal laws, rules, and statutes. Four, true communities provide members with social participation opportunities. The community fulfills member needs for companionship and sense of belonging. This may occur through many venues, including faith-based programs, business activities, educational groups and opportunities, book clubs, bingo parties, music concerts, recreation activities, health and wellness programs, internet connectivity, various disability and special population programs, etc. Five, true communities provide members with a sense of shared responsibility and concern for community members and the community at large. This function enables members to cooperate to accomplish tasks too large or too urgent to be handled by a single person, like raising funds to support a community hospital or clinic, building a playground for children, organizing a community response to drug addiction, etc. It also provides a network of support for individual members and families who have suffered a significant loss, tragedy, or illness, etc. These five community functions are essential for an adequate and healthy social environment and socialization of community members. Unfortunately, not all communities or societies are healthy. This slide lists some common attributes that dysfunctional communities lack, including clearly defined roles and goals, shared beliefs, values, institutions, and behaviors, clearly defined boundaries, community member ownership, provide valued roles for members, communicate effectively with members, adequate skills and resources, meet needs of members and share and draw on skills and resources where needed. Most of these community dysfunctions are associated with poorly engaged communities. It may indicate a group that fails to meet the definition of community or indicate poor leadership, etc. Poorly engaged communities often result in community deficiencies, gaps, or unmet needs related to the social environment determinants of health, economic, education, gender, spiritual, emotional, social support structure deficiencies, etc. These community support deficiencies can in turn result in further deterioration of community socialization and engagement. Sick communities, like sick people, often need help to recover. Public health is well positioned to facilitate a community engagement process to help break this destructive cycle and encourage communities to appropriately engage to address the social environment determinant needs of their members that can in turn result in enhanced engagement and socialization. Further discussion of community engagement is covered by other sessions and courses of the North Dakota Public Health Training Network. The fifth determinant of health category is access to healthcare services. Health does depend on appropriate access to healthcare services. Even if a person is born healthy, raised healthy, and engages in good health behaviors, 
there will still be times when that individual has to call on a health system for help. An example of that would be a pregnant woman that requires a C-section due to fetal distress. The expectant mother may have had adequate prenatal care and prepared well throughout her pregnancy, yet an unforeseen complication of pregnancy at term requires accessing hospital care. Healthcare access is an essential determinant of health. Let's briefly consider the relationship of healthcare access to a country's economy and how healthcare is paid for. This table from Peters et al. in 2008 demonstrates healthcare access disparities based on income and region. Rows highlighted values are less than global averages. Available hospital beds per 10,000 population and doctors and nurses per 1,000 population were much lower for low and low middle income countries versus high income countries. Africa, followed by Southeast Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean WHO regions also had much lower availability of hospital beds, doctors and nurses versus the Americas, Europe and Western Asia. Western Asia had hospital beds above the global average, even higher than the Americas, but were below the global average for doctors and nurses. At the national level, poorer countries tend to have less access to health services than wealthier ones. Lower middle income countries account for 90% of the global burden of disease but for only 12% of global spending on health. Therefore, it's not surprising that the density of health workers and hospital beds per population are much lower in lower middle income than in high income countries, decreasing the availability of services to many of the world's poor. So the economic determinant of individuals and countries is directly correlated with access to healthcare services. The poorer the country, the larger the amount of out-of-pocket payments for healthcare services. A WHO report from 2002 demonstrated that 35 to 62.2% of payments for healthcare services were out-of-pocket for seven African countries, including Burkina Faso, Chad, Congo, Ivory Coast, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Kenya. In contrast, out-of-pocket payments for healthcare services in high-income countries is generally 20%. Out-of-pocket payments for healthcare is the most inequitable type of healthcare financing targeting the poor and creates enormous access barriers to healthcare services. All five of these determinant categories impact the health of individuals and families around the globe. The importance of addressing a broad range of health determinants was demonstrated in a Centers for Disease Control CDC report in 1999. The CDC determined that the lifespan of Americans increased by approximately 30 years from 1900 to 1999. Only five of those years could be attributed to healthcare access and technological advances, including medications like antibiotics, surgical technology, and life support, etc. 25 years were due to other interventions that addressed additional determinants of health. Addressing health determinants beyond healthcare access and technology often falls under the jurisdiction of public health and other stakeholders and requires effective integration of public health, healthcare, and many other private and nonprofit organizations. An Institute of Medicine IOM report in 2012 focused on the need for increased integration of public health and other stakeholders to improve the health of the public. 
even though this report focused on the integration of public health and primary care, the concept of increasing integration across other silos applies to the work of public health in general. One of the most used diagrams from that 2012 IOM report is adapted on this slide. There is a continuum of integration from isolation to merger. In between those poles rest awareness, coordination, collaboration, and partnerships. Isolation means that groups have no idea of what others are doing. Awareness means that groups are cognizant of others working in common areas of interest, but have no engagement between groups. Coordination, collaboration, and partnerships are defined as increasing levels of working together. Also, as one moves from the left pole of isolation to merger, there is increasing dependence or interdependence of groups on each other. Merger is the state of total immersion and fusion. Isolation and merger are relatively uncommon. Most experts feel that much of what is done currently in integration falls into awareness and coordination with too little true collaboration and partnerships. Collaboration and partnerships can also be defined as effective coalitions as diagrammed. The Institute of Medicine strongly recommended that increased collaboration and partnerships or the development of effective coalitions are needed to adequately address future health and wellness goals. Collaboration and partnerships don't just happen. They are created utilizing coalition building, team building, and boundary spanning skills and competencies. The goal of team building, boundary spanning, and coalition building is to facilitate groups to effectively work together toward common goals. Therefore, these three sets of skills and competencies possess many similar concepts and techniques. Unique team building and boundary spanning skills and competencies are discussed in other sessions of the North Dakota Public Health Training Network. In summary, all determinants of health must be understood to develop impactful global health goals. Environmental determinants cause a significant disease burden globally. The social environment has a major influence on healthy behaviors. Engaged communities are essential to provide an adequate social network. Economics are major drivers of health. Effective integration is essential to address global health problems.